Pardon me? It's so nice to see you virtually live here in Zoom. Yes, it is very nice to see you all as well. Hi, Dr. Saki, how are you doing? It's <laughs> nice to see you all. It's been, a <laughs> it's been a long time since I've been in Pondi. I hope you're all staying safe during this pandemic. Yeah, we are all extra safe in Pondicherry here. Wonderful. Yeah. All right, so let's pull up the presentation. Let's make sure you can see it and then we'll get started. Yeah, yeah. So we'll wait for some two more minutes for all the participants to join and then we'll... Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no problem. I'll just get this ready then in the meantime. Yeah, sure. Okay, are you able to see my intro slide? Yes, it's pretty clear here. Okay, we should be good to go then. Just let me know when you want me to start. I'm going to step away just for one minute. Okay, okay, fine. All right, how are patient volumes at Aravind? What have you guys been doing for clinical care for your patients right now? Our branches, we're just seeing uh, emergencies. So okay. uh, close to 100 patients per day. Okay. Yeah, following all the strict precautions. Yeah, that's a very, that's a sharp decrease. We're, we're doing the same at Wilmer. Oh, okay, 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 that's great. So I'll give a short introduction about you, Dr. Wally, and then you can start, okay? Okay, that sounds good. Okay, hello all. Good evening, uh, Zoom participants, and welcome back for um, Arabin Eye Hospital Pondicherry's lockdown lecture series for today. I'm so excited to welcome one of my close friends, Dr. Merav Wally, who's the Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology in Wilmer Eye Institute. Johns Hopkins Medicine, Baltimore. So she specializes in cornea and external diseases, including cataracts, keratoplasties, and refractive surgeries. And among all of these, uh, one of her uh, major areas of research is keratoplasty, its advances, and how to decrease graft rejection. And uh, hence, I'm sure today we are going to have an amazing lecture with a great insight. And also, she's such a skillful surgeon, and I was so lucky to witness her keratoplasties in person when I was there in Wilmer in 2018. And thank you, Merav, once again, for being such a wonderful host for me and Aravind, and welcome you back once again. No problem at all. Thank you for inviting me. It's wonderful to be with all of you, albeit virtually. Um, so let's get started. Um, we're going to be talking, as um, Dr. Christie said, about advances in corneal transplantation. So just the brief objectives. We'll start with a brief history of corneal transplants and an overview of the different types of transplants. We'll discuss PKP and DALC, mainly the indications and complications. Um, then we'll go into a detailed discussion of endothelial keratoplasty, so both DSEC and DMEC. We'll talk about the indications, the surgical techniques, and uh, complications for that as well. So history of corneal transplantation. The first corneal successful corneal transplantation was done in 1905 by Dr. Edward Zerm. Um, it was a full thickness corneal transplant from a living donor. Um, the picture that you see on the bottom of the screen is the gentleman who received the transplant. So he had uh, been working in a lime factory and he basically had kind of a base injury to both of his eyes. His corneas were opacified and a child happened to come to see Dr. Zerm, an 11 year old child with foreign bodies in both of his eyes which could not be retrieved. Um, and so he got permission from the father to enucleate the child's eyes, and then he implanted them in the patient. And so as you can see in the picture, one failed, but one survived, and the patient was able to go back to work and be productive for the remainder of his life, which was pretty amazing. So that's, I think, the first solid organ transplant recorded in the world. Um, after that, the first corneal transplant from a deceased donor was uh, done by Dr. Filatov, and that was in 1931. 
And the first eye bank um, was then established in 1955 by Dr. Thomas, um, who was a Welsh ophthalmologist and worked at the Welsh School of Medicine and actually was the head of it. And he actually did his first corneal transplant in 1934. So it has been some time uh, since people have started doing transplants. Um, very uh, briefly, you all know the, it's all a bunch of ophthalmologists, so you all know the layers of the cornea. Um, we're going to be focusing, obviously, um, on the cornea, and we have your epithelium, Bowman's layer, stroma, um, Dua's layer, decimase, and the endothelium. Dua's layer is not shown in this image. So the different types of transplants that we do as corneal uh, transplant surgeons are so full thickness transplants, um, which include penetrating keratoplasties and keratoprosthesis. The pictures you see here on the right hand side, the top one is of a PKP and the bottom one is of a KPRO. Uh, next is a deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, which is similar to the PKP, except we don't transplant the endothelium and decimase membrane. And the image you see here on the right is of a dolk. It's hard to differentiate it from a PK in this image. You would need a slit beam to be able to see that the host's decimase is still intact. Next, we move to our endothelial keratoplasties, and we have two types. So we have a DSEC, decimase stripping automated endothelial keratoplasty, and then we have DMEC, a, a decimate membrane endothelial keratoplasty. And the images you see here on the right, the top one is of a DSEC, and the bottom one is of the DMEC. The difference between the two uh, being that the DSEC has some uh, residual posterior stroma, whereas DMEC is a perfect anatomic uh, transplant with just replacement placement of decimase and the endothelium. So I'd like to start, as I had mentioned, by talking about penetrating keratoplasties in brief. Um, so penetrating keratoplasties, as I mentioned, are full thickness corneal transplants. Um, they are required when you have pathology in the deep posterior stroma or with your endothelium. Uh, the goals of a penetrating keratoplasty, as with uh, most corneal transplants, is to restore kind of corneal structure and strength if there's a perforation, to remove an infectious inflammatory focus if there is an infection, um, and to restore vision. The images you see here on the right are images of penetrating keratoplasties. There are, we won't be going into the details of this surgery. Um, however, the top two pictures, the top one you see the transplant was completed with interrupted sutures. And in the second image, you see that there's a combination of interrupted and continuous sutures. And in the bottom, you see the transplant after suture removal, which usually can take up to a year, we'll discuss in a minute. The indications for penetrating keratoplasty vary, and so we'll go through them here. Corneal ectasia, degenerations, and dystrophies. So this would include keratoconus and pellucid marginal degeneration, oftentimes after one has had high drops. If they have not had high drops, they would be candidates for DALC, which we will talk about shortly. In the top picture, you see a patient with keratoconus who's had high drops, and you see that there's all this edema in kind of the lower cornea. And after that scars, that there's a break there in, in Bowman's, and then uh, there's oftentimes also going to be breaks in uh, decimase. And so in those cases, oftentimes we end up doing a penetrating keratoplasty. Um, if one has an infectious or non-infectious corneal ulcer, this can leave the eye with a decent amount of not only scarring, but also neovascularization that can oftentimes go through the posterior stroma. And so oftentimes PKP is indicated in these cases. Uh, you see an image on the bottom here um, of such a case. Corneal perforation is another reason we do a full thickness transplant because it's a full thickness perforation. Um, and then visual significant stromal scarring uh, with or without epithelial disease um, and different cases include Peter's anomaly where there's often some discontiguity in the decimase um, and longstanding PBK or Fuchs, um, although nowadays uh, we're much more likely to do endothelial keratoplasty for those cases. Um, and then post refractive surgery, repeat corneal transplants, and these are kind of among the top five to six reasons that one would do a penetrating keratoplasty. So patients have a lot of questions when it comes to PKP surgeries. And so some of the important things to tell them is that it's an outpatient same day surgery. It's done um, either with general anesthesia or with a block um, and MAC. I suspect we here use general anesthesia much more than uh, you all do in Aravind. 
Um, it's with donor, we use donor tissue, so deceased donor tissue. Um, we use topical drops in their post-op regimen, so they do not need oral medications um, for, to de decrease the chance of graft rejection. Um, and the most important thing is that it takes at least a year, if not more, for full visual rehabilitation. Uh, we often, at least here, wait at least six months prior to any suture removal um, to give the wound time to heal and have the cornea have more tectonic strength before you start releasing the sutures. And we usually start to release sutures two at a time uh, over like probably one to two months uh, until we've completed suture removal. And then the patient goes for rigid gas permeable contact lens fitting. <clears throat> Excuse me. As far as how long penetrating keratoplasties last, the corneal donor study has taught us a lot about this. Um, although the indication in the corneal donor study was oftentimes PKP for endothelial diseases, the results I'm going to tell you here, which is the uh, lowest risk reason to do a PKP. So these numbers may look better um, than for the reasons that we currently do PKPs. The 10-year graft failure was 21% that they found, and the risk factors for graft failure um, included pseudophagy or aphakic corneal edema, aphakic corneal edema having a worse outcome than pseudophakic uh, corneal edema. So 37% versus, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, and then 20%. Glaucoma surgery, so both trabeculectomies um, and uh, surgeries requiring a glaucoma uh, device, so a tube. Um, and then things that were trends but were not actually statistically significant, so older age, smoking, and African-American race seem to suggest a higher risk for graft failure in this study, which is the largest study of transplants in the world. So complications, just very briefly, that can happen intraoperatively with PKPs. Um, when preparing the host, you can have an irregular trephination. You can have damage to the iris or lens. Both of these can be avoided um, with kind of uh, being very careful when marking the eye and when removing the host cornea. Um, there can be issues with donor tissue preparation, um, poor graft centration, which again can be avoided by marking the donor tissue, a damage to the donor tissue itself um, when tree finding, um, and then a suprachoroidal hemorrhage uh, or effusion can happen intraoperatively, in which case the eye has to be closed expeditiously. Post donor tissue placement, you can have incarceration of iris tissue um, in the wound. And so that just requires being very vigilant and making sure you do a sweep to make sure that there's no iris tissue before you finalize your closure and then vitreous in the anterior chamber. Complications that can happen with PKPs. Um, so rejection, and there are four types, endothelial being the most common and the one that we see most often in our clinics. Um, the symptoms are decreased vision, pain, and photophobia. Um, and you can, in clinics, see conjunctival injection, corneal edema, and AC inflammation, including uh, KP. And in the top picture here, in both of the pictures, you see patients who are rejecting. In the top one here, you see a pigmented line that's going across the cornea, um, that's referred to as a hododus line. Um, and that's usually, you'll see uh, keratocratic uh, precipitates kind of marching up, and then you'll see them stop and a line, a pigmented line forms. When you see rejection, the first thing to do is to try frequent steroids. Oftentimes, it can be resor uh, resolved with kind of Q1 hour steroids initially um, around the clock and then slowly tapering over time. Uh, very rarely, people will also use oral um, steroids. There are risks associated with that, especially if patients have diabetes, and so one has to be careful. Um, but the vast majority of times, it can be resolved with just topical steroids complications that one can see. Um, so you can have donor failure, and this is true of kind of all transplants. Um, glaucoma, incidence of glaucoma tends to be higher with PKPs. Um, and then dehiscence, which is what you see in this image here. So you can see on the left-hand side, there is a little bit of iris protruding between the sutures at one and two o'clock. Um, and then on the right-hand side, when you do a Seidel test, it's positive. And so this has to be taken back to the operating room. Other complications one can see, ulceration, um, which is what you see in the images here on the right, which has to be treated as any other corneal ulcer. They are at slight increased risk of progression, both because they're on steroids and because they have a wound, which this uh, infection is around the wound, and so they have to be monitored more closely. Uh, endophthalmitis, and then choroidal hemorrhage. 
And you see here, this is an image of a patient with a choroidal hemorrhage. You see everything is pushed forward. So there's no space between the iris um, and the cornea. Um, and there's a lot of uh, positive uh, posterior pressure from that hemorrhage. And then recurrent diseases that can occur in the graft are kind of herpes and dystrophies can also recur depending on which dystrophy the time at which it recurs is different. When it comes to suture removal, um, the uh, first there are kind of refractive reasons you're doing suture removals. And so oftentimes that's to kind of improve the vision. And so oftentimes you'll want to do corneal topography or if you have a corneal tomography. Um, and then here, this is topography that you see on the right hand side. Um, and you can also do a manifest refraction to see how much you're improving their vision as you go along. Um, you want to start by removing the sutures at the steep axis, um, which is why topography can help you. Um, or if you have a placido disc, um, a handy in clinic, you can actually just use the placido disc uh, against your slit lamp and have the reflect and use the reflection um, to see where the steep axis is to remove the sutures. Um, there are structural reasons to remove sutures. So loose sutures need to come out or else they can cause suture abscesses. Um, and then neovascularized sutures also need to come out earlier or else the neovascularization will track along the suture and go into the words, the center of your cornea, which can lead to problems, including lipid deposits, higher risk for rejection. And then as we talked about, as we mentioned earlier, you'll want to start suture removal usually at, le at least, you want to wait at least six months, three months only if it's a dog, um, postoperatively. There are different ways of doing it. We usually do a drop of antibiotic before and after, and we use a 30 gauge on a TV syringe and jeweler's forceps, but there are different ways of doing that. All right, so the uh, cousin of PKP is our doll here, the deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. Um, so in the deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, the deep stromal bed is excised. And so you're just leaving the host decimase membrane and the endothelium. Um, very rarely, you can retain a thin stromal layer, namely Dula's layer, if that's not removed. And so the image you see on the right, which I showed earlier in the top, is an image of a dulk that was done in a patient um, with keratoconus. Um, and then in the bottom here, you see um, kind of when, how the, there one way of doing a dog procedure. So the big bubble, which was uh, described by Anwar et al, um, which describes basically an air injection in pre duas layer that if you're in the right layer, it will propagate kind of throughout the stroma. And that's what you see in the bottom left hand picture. And in the bottom right hand, once they propagated that air everywhere, they then dissect down and remove the entire layer leaving just decimase. And because you have a nice air pocket there, you're protected from actually perforating or damaging your decimase membrane. Uh, some people also just do a manual dissection. So they'll manual dissect down as deep as they can into the stroma and then place air. So there are different ways of doing adults. The more in, in all centers, places that do more are kind of more adept at doing the surgery. When it comes to dogs, it is important to try to do a dog. So most cases that you do a PK for a dog can be done. And dogs do have better outcomes, which we'll discuss just now. So indications for dogs are similar to PKPs. So stromal dystrophies or scars when the patient has a healthy endothelium and decimase, a corneal ectasia, so things like keratoconus, a corneal surface disease and corneal um, ulcers with scarring, um, as long as it's in the posterior stroma, but is not full thickness. So when you compare DALCs and PKPs, um, the vision and refractive error is equal, as are the higher order uh, aberrations. However, endothelial cell loss at one year is better with a DALC. So it's only 12.9% loss of the endothelium, where with a PKP, it's almost 28%. Um, and there are other advantages to a dog. So there's basically almost no risk of endothelial rejection since the patient's host and decimase has been left in place. And so the rejection you will often see is with epithelial, stromal, and mixed. So it's a much lower rate of rejection. You also avoid any intraocular complications. So the um, when the eyes closed as an, as an adult, anything that happens with kind of the eye open sky as in PKP is far reduced, if not gone. And then wound stability. So in adult, you have your wound, but the wound is supported by decimates. And so it's not a full thickness circumferential wound. And so this leads to you being able to remove sutures faster. People will sometimes start even at three months. 
Um, the disadvantages of a dog would be that it's technically difficult um, and it takes a longer time, right? Because you have to sit there and you have to dissect very carefully. Um, and there's also a risk of decimase perforation during your dissection. And so you would have to convert, um, but then you're just converting to a full thickness. And so other than lost time, there's not too many other disadvantages there. Um, the last one is we have now an interface, right? With the PK, it's a full thickness. With the DALC, you have the partial thickness graft, and then you have the host decimase and endothelium. So you have an interface. And in that interface, there could be effects on vision. Although I showed you earlier that in studies, they haven't found any decreased vision with the DALC from that. All right, now endothelial keratoplasty, which is what we're going to spend the remainder of this talk talking about and going through surgical techniques. Um, so let's just do a little bit about history. The first successful endothelial keratoplasty for corneal edema was done by Dr. Tillett, and this was in 1956. Um, it was not the endothelial keratoplasty we know now. In the late 1990s and early 2000s is when the modern era of endothelial keratoplasty, including the procedures we know now, came into place. Um, so the first modernization of endothelial keratoplasty came when a self-adherent graft tissue with an air bubble was described in something called a posterior lamellar keratoplasty, a PLK. Um, this required kind of a manual dissection. There were improvements in this procedure, um, simplifying the procedure with new instrumentations, which was called DLEC, uh, deep lamellar endothelial keratoplasty. And then the kind of biggest jump after DLEC came when the microkeratome was created. Because once the microkeratome was created, you weren't having to dissect your own tissue. You weren't having to uh, do that in the operating room. It was automated donor preparation. So now we have DSEC. So it was automated with a microkeratome still in the operating room, and then you would be kind of doing your desmetorexis. And then in 2006, iBank started using the microkeratomes to prepare tissue and provide surgeons with already prepared tissue. So now we come into your DSAC, so your uh, decimate stripping automated endothelial keratoplasty, um, which is kind of standard of care now here in the US. And then in 2006, um, it was also at the same time uh, described the endothelial decimase um, kind of DMEX. So just endothelial and decimase being replaced without any posterior stroma attached. Um, and then since then, DMEC has kind of slowly taken off. We'll, we'll talk about um, that in just a little bit. So kind of why should one do endothelial keratoplasty? You know, PKs seem to have decent outcomes um, and they're, very, they're pretty low risk when it comes to indications like Fuchs and PBK. Um, and so what is the reason that one should even consider doing endothelial keratoplasty? There are actually many reasons. So it maximizes corneal clarity and it improves on endothelial cell counts. Um, you have structural integrity of the cornea. So it's a much smaller incision. There is no large full thickness wound that goes circumferentially in the cornea. Um, and, there, and as a result, there's a marked reduction in astigmatism. And so there's kind of minimal topographic effects. There is a slight hyperopic shift, um, which you can kind of account for um, if you're doing a cataract surgery combined. And then there is faster recovery and better final both uncorrected visual acuity and best corrected visual acuity. In the bottom here, you see kind of the results for this DSEC, and this is at one, on average, about one year. The study actually went up to two years, but follow-up was different in different groups. Um, the kind of about almost 80, 78 percent uh, achieved vision of 2040 or better, um, and 14 percent achieved vision of 2020 or better, and this is best corrected vision. Um, and these percentages are much higher than what one sees with a penetration keratoplasty and does not require the fitting of a rigid gas permeable uh, contact lens or a scleral contact lens, uh, which makes this much superior and much easier for the patient as well. So the the sex surgery also minimizes, uh, minimizes recuperation time. So when it comes to PKP, as I was saying there, it takes a long time to recover. You have to wait at least six months um, before you start taking out sutures. In the case of DSEC, um, it's really just the 
first kind of week with positioning and then after that the first month and then after that it's just giving the time i to heal the i time to heal and so it's a much quicker recuperation um, and complications are much lower so it's a much lower incidence of allograft rejection and so these are kind of the many reasons why um, everyone should start thinking of switching to endothelial keratoplasty so the indications for endothelial keratoplasty and the indications are basically the same for DSEC and DMEC, which is why I'm talking about them together here. So Fuchs dystrophy, at least for us here in the States, is probably the leading um, reason that we're doing endothelial keratoplasty. Um, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, so post-cataract surgery edema. Um, and then any other cause, honestly, of endothelial di dysfunction, PPMD, tread, ice, um, and then if repeat corneal transplants are needed, um, even under a PKP, so over time, if, even if a PKP is cleared over 20, 30 years, the endothelium will fail. Um, and then when doing a repeat corneal transplant, you can do endothelial keratoplasty underneath the PK before considering repeating the whole surgery, the whole penetrating keratoplasty. And the DSEC under PK also has quicker recovery. Okay, so we're gonna talk in a little bit more detail about the DSEC surgery. So kind of pre-op preparation. So the main thing that you need to do when decide, after you decide that this patient needs a DSEC is figuring out what kind of tissue you're going to order from your eye bank, uh, assuming you're not preparing your own tissue. I guess if you're preparing your own tissue, um, oftentimes ultra thin is not something you can prepare yourself in the operating room, um, but you'll have to decide where to set your microkeratome. So generally, um, for us, we're looking at either thin or ultra thin DSEC tissue. So thin would be kind of between one and 200. And honestly, probably at this point, I think the majority are doing between one and 150 microns. Um, and then ultra thin tissue would be less than 100 microns. There have been studies that show that the thinner the tissue, kind of the faster and the better visual recovery. Um, and so there has been a push to move towards ultra thin tissue um, because studies, as I just said, have shown faster, better visual recovery with kind of better refractive outcomes, less endothelial cell loss, and a lower incidence of kind of any, any of the complications associated uh, with a transplant. Ultra thin tissue can be more difficult to manipulate than thin tissue. And so my advice would be if you're just switching or you're kind of in your early cases of endothelial keratoplasty using thin tissue, and then once you're comfortable with the procedure, then switching to ultra thin, um, it would probably be an easier way to go as a surgeon. I'd like to go through some kind of surgical videos of kind of two ways of doing um, a DSEC surgery. So here, this is a case of mine and a patient who'd come referred. Uh, she had a very edematous cornea with her epithelium that was uh, almost non-adherent, almost had an ABMD type texture. Um, the graft, she'd had two failed grafts and this graft was actually in a, uh, they'd had to put a suture through it. So I suspected they have, must have had issues with the graft attaching. Um, there were a PAS, a suprotemporally and in the nasal corner, there's actually a very large iridectomy, which becomes relevant later in the case, which we'll discuss. So I like to make an infratemporal and a suprotemporal wound through which I'll put in air, viscoelastic. Um, here I put in viscoelastic so I can strip the graft. And so I'm trying to release it. Um, it's pretty adherent. The patient had had a decent amount of post-op inflammation. And so, here you see me going around and scoring in a circle, which is the same thing I would do for a desmetorexis, except in this case, there's already a graft in place and I'm just trying to release the adhesion of the graft uh, from the donor graft from the host. Um, once we do that, um, then I'll go ahead and make an incision. And after making the incision, we'll take out the tissue. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Initially, I usually worked with a small incision, so I'll do my regular cataract 2.4 or 2. Point, in this case, it was a 2.75 wound. Um, I'll take out the tissue. In this case, I did it slightly differently. I enlarged my wound to four millimeters here and then did my IA. Oftentimes, I'll do it with the smaller incision so as not to get iris prolapse and then enlarge the wound. Now, the method that I use, I'm just going to pause this for a minute. So the method that there are different methods of inserting the DSEC tissue. The method I use is I cut a lens gl sheath glide down to four millimeters. So when it comes uh, initially, it's five and a half millimeters, and I don't like making such a large incision. Um, it, a, it's, the incision is large, and uh, B, your anterior chamber isn't stable, so you can't make a self-sealing wound. 
Um, at four millimeters, even though that's still a large wound, it's more likely to be self-seeding. You can make a biplanar wound. Um, and it's all that you need to insert the tissue. So this is a lens glide cut to four millimeters. Um, and then you'll see in just a minute, I put the tissue um, and I'll show you how I remove the tissue. I put it on endothelial side down and I use a 30 gauge needle, which I bend at the tip to 60 degrees and then I push the tissue in. There are other ways of pushing the tissue in that don't require a lens glide. There is a device called an endoserter um, where you put the tissue into, um, it's a little contraption that kind of folds the tissue for you. And then you can in inject the tissue into the eye. Um, there were studies initially done saying that there was uh, maybe reduced endothelial cell loss um, with that. Um, in the end, um, the longer uh, studies haven't shown a difference. Um, however, some people prefer the endoserter. Um, and there are also a few other kind of techniques for inserting tissue in. We'll talk about the other way to insert tissue is to pull through the tissue. We'll talk about that in the next video. So here I'm checking that the size that I cut fits through the wound um, and I'm making sure it's stable. I put a little bit of heel on there um, because that's where we're going to put our tissue because we don't want to damage the endothelium when we're pushing it into the eye. Here you see the tissue. So I've already prepared the tissue. It came from the eye bank. It was already, uh, this is a thin tissue. This was uh, about hundred microns. Um, I tree find it. So uh, eight millimeters is what I like to use in this patient. And I have an orientation stamp on my tissue to make sure that I don't do an upside down graft. I use patent spatula to pull up the tissue and I use the 0.12 forceps to hold the anterior stroma to help me separate the tissue without touching the endothelium or manipulating the graft. So you don't want to manipulate the graft if you can. And then this is the 30 gauge needle I had mentioned that I bent. I push the tissue in and then you have to kind of rotate the needle and pull it out so it doesn't catch the tissue. And then I just close the wound as I'm pulling out the lens glide so the tissue doesn't follow me out. Once the tissue is in, the next thing to do uh, as quickly as you can is suture the wound um, because you don't want any wound or air to leak through because the next step is gonna be positioning the tissue. And since this is a 4.0 millimeter wound, I put in three sutures. You can sometimes get away with two. Um, I injected a little bit of BSS there just to pressurize the eye as I was uh, finishing my sutures that uh, you may have seen. And then after the sutures are in place, you put in air to try to position the graft. Now, in this case, um, you can see at the end of the case, I have a very small air bubble. So usually you want to leave a very large air bubble. So usually you want to leave an air bubble that's about 80% of the anterior chamber. Um, however, in this case, if you remember at the beginning, I had mentioned that there was a very large iridectomy nasally. That nasal iridectomy, as soon as the bubble got large enough to touch the edge of that iridectomy, the air went behind the iridectomy and pushed up the iris. And so we were not able to actually have an air bubble larger than this. So there were two options. One was to leave a small air bubble, which I decided to do. I suspected that she would be okay with attaching, especially since she had some inflammatory issues initially. The other issue would have been to just suture the iridectomy. So to do uh, a basically, a, <clears throat> excuse me, um, either a mechanical or a seepster knot to close the iridectomy. And then you would have been able to put air that's larger than that iridectomy and it would have been able to hold. But as I mentioned, I decided the former. And so I left a small, so this air bubble is probably only about 40% 40, uh, 40 of the anterior chamber. Um, and then everything looked good. The tissue was in excellent position. It was nice and attached. Um, I did wait 15 minutes uh, after the air bubble and the tissue were in the right place to make sure that I saw the tissue adhering. And at this moment, and I didn't show it in this video because I edited it out, um, as I'm waiting, I will actually sweep with a barricara sweep. I'll go from the center of the cornea out to the edge of the cornea in all four quadrants. The reason to do that is if there is any slight fluid left in the interface, that will help sweep the fluid out of the interface. Um, and then the last thing is the one, I know sometimes people say, well, how can you tell that the tissue is attached? When you push on your cornea to do the sweep, you should see the folds in the anterior cornea reflected in the decimase. That tells you that they're connected. And so seeing those reflective folds tells you, okay, I don't have fluid and my tissue is nice and kind of adherent now.
And so at the end of the case, we give an antibiotic and a steroid, in our case, ANSEV and Decadron. So that's the injection that we're giving here. And I have my patients lie in the post-op area for one to two hours because I want them lying flat. And the reason I keep them in the post-op area, and I know that at uh, Arvin, sometimes things are different because sometimes things are, people are staying overnight, but for us, they always go home, um, is when patients start to leave your and they go in the car and then they're going into their home or a hotel as the case may be, there's a lot of movement. They sit up, they're not always positioning their heads. So I like to give them a few hours where the positioning is perfect uh, because it's under, it's in the operating room or in the PACU, I in the recovery area. And then I go and I do actually examine them at that time to make sure that everything is nice and attached, to make sure that the bubble is not too large. Sometimes if air goes behind the iris, when they're lying down for two hours, it can come forward. And so your 80% bubble could turn into 100% bubble, which will lead to pupillary block. And so what, if there are any issues, I can fix them right there before the patients go home. And I've had good success with that. Um, I would then see the patient the next day to check for pressure and to check for kind of how the, where the graft is, how is it, is it centered? Is it still well attached? The next video that I'm going to show you is the other technique. So instead of pushing or injecting in the tissue, you can pull the tissue across the eye. Um, and this is actually a very nice, this can be a very nice technique because it's very controlled. Uh, this is actually a colleague of mine, Dr. Alan Negrari, who's also a corneal transplant specialist at Wilmer, um, it's his video. And so the tissue here is folded in an endoglide. And so there, he uses an injector. This injector is called a Desipro. The Desipro is created by um, the, our division chief here at Wilmer, Dr. Albert Jun. It's a forcep that is made specifically for transplants for both DMEC and for DSEC, um, but especially for DMEC. Um, actually, just a minute. This video is actually of a DSEC. This is actually of a DMEC. We'll come back to this in a minute. So I'm going to skip this in just a minute. This one is not the DSEC video. Um, we'll, we'll talk about this um, when we're at the DMEC section. My apologies, everybody. That was in that that surgery is actually a DMEC, not a DSEC. Um, but the concept of pulling through the tissue, where the tissue is in an endoglide, and you're using a forcep to pull it across the eye, um, also holds for DSEC. I just happen not to do it that way. So after you've done your DSEC, this is what it should look like. So your cornea will be nice and clear. You'll have here, as you see on the left-hand side, you'll have the tissue that's nice and centered. And here on the right-hand side um, is an anterior segment OCT taken in the center of the cornea. Um, and this is kind of the following day. You can vaguely see in the top image that there is an air bubble there. And that air bubble, and right below the air bubble, is where they focus the anterior segment OCT. And the second image and the third image, you can see that you have your anterior cornea. And then there's a faint line, which is your donor host interface. And then you have your DSEC tissue. And you see there's no space. It's perfectly attached. And so with a DSEC, you can actually see this at the slit lamp when you're doing your post-op day one exam. If you make the slit beam very small and you look, you can see if it's well attached all the way across. Um, the same with DMEC. It can sometimes be harder with DMEC. And so anterior segment OCT, if you have one in your clinic, can be very helpful, but it's not 100% necessary. This can be seen just at the slit lamp. So again, the DSEC versus PK argument, which we discussed earlier, faster visual recovery, better vision, decreased rejection risk. It's a closed system. So as you saw, there was never a point in that surgery where we had to open up the eye. The largest incision was the incision to put in the tissue, which was in this case, a 4.0 millimeter incision. So there, we did not talk about what are the disadvantages. So why is it that sometimes people are, were initially hesitant to switch to DSEC? So you have donor dislocation. So the graft can dislocate, it can separate from your cornea. Here on the right-hand side, you see an image where that disc is dislocated. So if you look at that slit beam, there's a slight area of hypolucence where it's a little darker. That's the airspace, which you should not be seeing. Um, and then in addition, you have kind of interface issues. So you can have issues at the interface between the graft and the host. 
And then this image that you see here on the bottom of the graph shows you endothelial cell survival. Um, initially, you have a larger drop in the endothelial cells in BSEC versus PK. However, over time, endothelial cell loss is actually less with DSEC than with PKs. So this is just more of the DSEC complication of dislocation. Um, again, here you can see this is a much larger dislocation than I showed you in the image before. And the entire cornea is edematous. It's not nice and clear anymore because you don't have an endothelium attached. Um, and so this bottom image is your anterior segment OCT. And in that anterior segment OCT, you can see that the tissue, which should be nice and attached, which we saw in our initial anterior segment OCT, now it has this little dip and that's the dislocation. This has to be taken back to the operating room to do a rebubble. Um, if you have a procedure room in your clinic, you can do a rebubble in clinic. You have to use obviously sterile technique um, and you will want the patient to lie flat for at least an hour or two to make sure that the tissue has a chance to re-adhere before you kind of send them on their way. So the other complications that you see unique to DSEC are a bubble-induced angle closure. So the patient that I showed you the image of had a large iridectomy, so I was not concerned um, about angle closure. Um, and all DSEC patients, you do need to do kind of a small iridectomy. And so most people will do an iridectomy at the time of surgery. Um, and that will, and usually they'll do it inferiorly. And um, that way you can fill the eye with your air bubble and you'll still have fluid being able to pass from the anterior to the posterior chamber. If you have angle closure, then you need to release, you need to release as much air as possible. Usually the patients will call that evening. Um, if not, you would see it the next morning. Uh, releasing air at this as soon as possible is best because otherwise you can actually get posterior anterior synechiae formation. And so you would have to, and at that point, you would have to go to the operating room to try to release those posterior anterior synechiae. That can increase the risk of rejection. Um, but this is usually reversible. And you, as long as it's caught early, um, it will not cause any permanent vision loss. But the longer you wait, the more likely you'll have permanent visual loss from this. So other complications you can see with DSEC are primary graft failure. So that's about six, and that's about 6% 6 in the literature that's been reported. Secondary graft failure, and then uh, graft rejection, which can happen months to years after a transplant. It's often not as symptomatic um, as a, in a PK. So they can usually have very mild symptoms. And so it's important to not only follow them closely, but to tell them if they have any symptoms to contact you or to present to clinic. And as we talked about, it, what do you want to watch them for when you're following them in clinic? So as I had mentioned, you see them a day after, a week after, a month after, and then after that, usually for us, we would see them three months after. So you're looking for pressure. So as we talked about initially, um, angle closure is the issue, but then afterwards, it's just IOP spikes from steroids. Um, graft attachment, so you want to check for small areas of separation at the slit lamp, as we discussed. Um, this oftentimes needs to be surgically fixed if you don't have a procedure room. If not, you can do a rebubble. Um, and then you want to check the corneal thickness. And the reason I say that is if you see consistent thickness increases from visit to visit, this could be an early sign of rejection. All right, so now we'll talk about DMEC. A quick question, do we, how much time? We have about uh, 15 minutes left. Is that right, Dr. Christie? Yes, Dr. Wale. Um, okay, and just, um, I know that you guys wanted time for questions. Have you all started doing DMEC and do you wanna go through the DMEC section or do you want to go to questions? No, we'll finish the DMEC uh, session and uh, okay. since we can take some 10 more minutes extra for the questions, that's not an mm -hmm. issue. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. all right then. So for DMEC, it's the same indications as DSEC, as I mentioned earlier. Um, however, if you're just starting to do DMEC, there are some things that I would suggest. So for your initial cases, um, focusing on pseudophagic patients um, with an indication of either Fuchs or PBK will make your pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, um, will make the surgery a little easier because they will have less kind of other issues that can complicate the surgical techniques that you'll be using for the DMEC. Um, characteristics to avoid. Uh, so if someone is aphagic, um, if they are hypotenuse, if they have a hypotenuse eye for some reason, if they're post vitrectomy, because again, the eye is oftentimes either hypotenuse or it doesn't hold its form as well. Um, post glaucoma surgery. So if they have a tube 
um, or even a trabeculectomy. Um, and if the patient is unable to lie flat, because um, more so than DSEC. So I didn't mention with DSEC, we usually have them lie flat for 24 to 48 hours. It's an air bubble, so it dissipates pretty quickly. Um, in DMEC, you want them, usually we use a gas bubble, which I'll talk about, and you want them to lie flat, um, oftentimes until that gas bubble dissipates. So we use SF6, and that can be four to five days. And so if they're unable to lie flat, uh, it's a much more difficult surgery because DMEC is much more likely to detach than DSEC. All right, so now as we, we talked about why do a DSEC versus a PK, why do a DMEC compared to DSEC? So what are the issues with DSEC that would make you want to do a DMEC? With a DSEC, you have kind of suboptimal visual acuity, um, although this is debatable. The difference in the end is only about one line if you do an ultra-thin DSEC. Um, you can get optical irregularity from the stromal layer duplication in DSEC. You can have interface issues, um, folds. This is much more likely with the DSEC because of that stromal layer. It makes the tissue uh, kind of uh, less able to adapt sometimes. Um, and then just the fact that you have excess tissue and excess thickness with the DSEC um, is part of the reason that you kind of don't have the same, you don't achieve the same visual acuity and the quality of the vision is also different. You have, much, you have more higher order aberrations. So what are, on the flip side, what are the advantages of a DMEX surgery? You have faster visual recovery. Uh, you have superior visual outcomes. So as I said, studies have now shown that it's about one line objective improvement as compared to ultra thin DSEC. If you're comparing it to just a regular DSEC, it can actually be two to three lines. So it's very different. Um, and then the subjective quality of vision is actually better. So there have been studies done where patients have a DMEC in one eye and a DSEC in the other eye, and the objective vision is the same and they will always prefer the DMEC eye. And that's because um, there is kind of a less higher order aberrations because of the kind of anatomic um, perfection of the DMEC, whereas DSEC has a duplication of the stromal layer. Smaller incision size. So with a DSEC, you're still going towards like a four millimeter incision size, depending on what technique you use with the pull through technique, you might be able to go down to about a 3.5 millimeter um, size uh, for where you're pulling the tissue in, uh, but not much less than that. With a DMEC, uh, the surgery can be done through a regular cataract wound through a 2.4 millimeter wound. Um, and so the smaller the incision size, the quicker the healing. Um, and then lastly, lower rate of allograft rejection. So with a DMEC, it's about 1.4 to 1 to 5%, which is what has been reported with DSEC 9% and with PKP 17%. So the disadvantages of DMEC are difficult donor preparation and the fact that it's difficult to master the transplant surgery um, and then also increased risk of uh, graft dislocation, which is not on this slide. So pre-op, so if you decide to do a DMEC, kind of what do you need to think of? So as I mentioned, first is patient selection, especially for your first few cases. You really don't wanna be doing any complex cases initially. You just want time to kind of master the surgery and the surgical techniques, which are uh, different from DSEC and a little more kind of complicated. Um, and then tissue. So there's different ways of prepping DMEC tissue. Uh, for us, we get eye bank tissue, but initially uh, tissue was actually prepared in the OR by surgeon. So depending on where you are, you might still have to do that. Um, but that is kind of a big hump into actually doing DMEC. So I think DMEC actually started taking off in America once we started having eye banks provide the tissue. There are two different types of tissues that eye banks can prepare. So one is they just, they pre-strip the tissue for you. So they separate decimase um, from the stroma, but they don't tree fine the tissue and you would tree fine the tissue yourself in the operating room. And I'll show you, um, we do that and uh, I used to do that. And so I'll show you a video of that. And then they can also provide pre-strip and pre tree fined tissue so both are done. And so you just kind of take off the tissue and put it in the eye after you put it in your injector. And then the last is preloaded tissue, um, which either the eye, that, which the eye bank oftentimes will create for you, or if you prepare your tissue in the R, you could also load it into your own injector. So the first surgery here I show you, I'm doing a DMEC, and this is the one where the eye bank pre-stripped the tissue, but they did not pre-tree fine it. And so let's start. So we're marking here the center of the cornea so that uh, we have our bearings. And then this is an 8-0 marker so that we know where we need to do our dysmetorexis. 
And so with a DMEC, I actually usually undersize the tissue. So this is an ADO desmetorexis, and the tissue that I'll be putting in is 7.5 millimeters just to avoid any overlap. It's much more likely to dislocate more so than a DSEC. And so we, we try to avoid uh, overlap as much as possible for that reason. And so here we do, this is a Fuchs case, so the dismetorexis is very simple. In a PBK case, it's usually much more difficult. Um, so after removing the tissue, there's a little tag there. You don't want any tags. You don't want any leftover decimates with where you're going to put the graft, because that will just increase your chances of graft dislocation. So this is the tissue that we received from the eye bank. They've stripped it. Um, and so we put a little bit of tripan so we can see the edge of where it's been stripped. And then we're doing our tree fine here. When we do the tree fine, it's a partial thickness tree fine where we're just going through decimase and just a little bit of the stroma. We take off that rim of tissue that's on the edge. And then the next step is going to be separating the edge. We're making sure they, that where they stripped is nice and free and that there's no adhesion because it's been sitting in it for about 24 hours before the tissue got to us. So we go very gently, being very careful not to rip the tissue. The tissue is very fragile. It's only 50 microns. And then once we know it's free, we lift it up. We soak it in the tripan for three minutes. And then, sorry, this part of the video is dark. We basically lifted the scroll, we put it into fluid, and then we lifted it up into this injector. So this injector, which um, there'll be more images of it in the next video, um, is the modified Strico Jones uh, injector, which is described by uh, Strico and Terry. And so it's a Jones tube that's connected to a 14 French catheter um, and then connected to a 3cc syringe. And so basically that tissue that you saw that was scrolled up, we had it in the tripan, we put it into a big bowl of uh, BSS, and then we sucked up the BSS and the tissue. And so this tissue is now immersed in BSS within the injector, and now we're going to inject it into the eye. Before doing this, before putting the tissue into the injector, we did check to make sure that the injector and the wound were a good fit. Because once you're at this point, you don't want to be doing any testing, you want to move as quickly as possible. So, so now we injected the tissue into the anterior chamber. We put a suture into the main wound. And now this is the part of the DMEC that's hard. It's trying to tap the tissue into place. And there are different techniques, which is a whole lecture in and of itself. But here we tap and we tap and we kind of nudge the tissue and we're able to get it centered um, pretty easily actually in this eye. Um, and then after we have it in the position we want it to be in, we go ahead and you'll see in just a minute, we put in our air bubble. Uh, the bubble initially we put in is air and then we switch it with gas. So the gas that we use, as I mentioned, is SF6 gas. So 20% because that's non-expansile, which is important. You don't want it expanding in the eye after your surgery. Um, and we will oftentimes in the operating room, like here you see it's at about 90%. We actually released a little bit so that it was 80% before we had the patient leave the operating room. Um, similar to my DSEC, I will leave patients in the recovery area for an hour or two, and I will examine them before they leave. And what we, you did not see here is that this patient has actually a PI inferiorly, and I actually do my PIs in clinic two weeks before I do a YAG PI um, inferiorly at six o'clock. Um, and that allows me not to have to manipulate the iris during the surgery. DMEX surgery is a harder surgery because the tissue is thinner than DSEC tissue. And so if possible, I like to avoid dealing with any heme or any pigment in the anterior chamber. You will see some people do the um, iridectomy in the operating room, and that's in interoperatively like they do for DSEC, and that is possible, but I find this to be much neater, and it just it makes it um, less of a headache. The only bad part is that the patient has to come back, uh, you know, two weeks before the surgery, and so sometimes that's just not feasible based on where the patient is coming from. All right, so... This is now just a kind of uh, also another DMEX. So this I used pre the preloaded tissue. So I did not prepare the tissue in the or I did not have to tree find the tissue. The tissue came already within the injector. 
So they, the eye bank will send us the injector. We take out the injector. It's usually an Optisol. So I wash out the Optisol and then I can, and then I fill it with BSS um, and then I inject the tissue. So it is much quicker because you don't have to manipulate the tissue at all. And so this is something uh, I switched to uh, about two years ago when the eye bank started offering it. And so here, similar to the other one, um, I've tested making sure that the injector fits, um, and then we go ahead and inject the tissue. I had, in this case, the tripan that uh, had actually washed out, and so I actually restained the tissue um, when, that I got. And so now, once we have the tissue here, as we did in the other case, there are different maneuvers. So usually, we shallow the eye um, to try to get the tissue to open up. If shallowing doesn't work, we tap. Um, and if the tapping with one doesn't work, we'll tap with two instruments. And the two instrument tap, um, which you'll see in just a minute, helps you where the part that's out, you hold it in place. And then you kind of do quick taps on the part that's not unfolded to try to unfold that remaining part. And sometimes in this case, the tissue was moving to the angle. So I injected BSS into the eye to try to shift the tissue. Um, because if it's, if it's right in the angle, then you'll have a hard time. And so here it's mostly unfolded, you see. And so now we're just trying to shallow the anterior chamber to try to unfold that last part. And now the tissue is nice and centered. And then we go ahead and put our SF6 bubble uh, right underneath. And when you go in, you want to make sure that you're right up against the iris and the lens. You don't want to, you want to make sure that you're nowhere near your tissue. And so we put in the SF6 bubble and then we just make sure that everything is nice and watertight. And then uh, before going into here, I actually want to go back to that DMEC video. So the other way of doing DMEC is the pull through technique that I had mentioned earlier. And so the beauty about this pull through technique is you don't have to worry a lot about tapping if it goes well. So you can pull your tissue into the anterior chamber and this injector, which Dr. John created actually has a little irrigation. So now Dr. Igarari here is actually putting pumps of BSS to try to unfold the tissue while he's holding the tissue. And so it's actually an excellent technique for people who are starting for complicated eyes, such as vitrectomized eyes, um, because you're holding the tissue while you're getting the tissue to unfold. So you don't have to sit there trying to tap and trying to worry that your chamber is not shallowing. So in this case, it makes the surgery much quicker. So going back to our DMEC, um, the, if you have an, so the last thing I wanted to show you is just these, I have these images of intraoperative OCT. Um, so we have an intraoperative OCT, which is really nice to use. In this case, it wasn't exactly necessary. It was just mainly showing what the intraoperative OCT can do. So in this step, I had done the desmetorexis, but I had left it attached centrally. And you can see the tissue on the sides is not attached, but it's attached centrally. So that was all I wanted to show there. Here, this is after I completed the desmetorexis. So here you see that there is hyperreflective tissue. That's your decimase. Here in the next slide, it's gone. So this is your stroma without decimase. And then next, this is after I put in the graft, but it's not attached. So I hadn't put in an air bubble yet and the graft had folds in it. And you can see on the right hand side that there is this kind of wiggle tissue that's not attached. And so that's just, but I could see that. So this was more just to show what the OCT could do. And then lastly here, this is with the tissue attached. I have the SF6 bubble there and you can see on the right hand side that the tissue is attached. You have that hyper reflected decimase that's nice and attached now. So this is uh, the, actually the patient in whom I did the uh, second surgery. And so these are images, the uh, first three images are from post-op week one. So the bubble had dissipated and the cornea was actually already clear, the gutte are gone. Um, you can see in the slit beam image how this is basically perfect anatomically. Um, and so this is, um, you can see the DMEC tissue and then you see the stroma. Um, in the bottom left image, you can see that there's a PI there at six o'clock and that's where the YAG PI that I did in clinic. And then that bottom right image is actually three months out. So at a week, the patient was 2020 um, and he had started off at 2060. And then at a month, he was 2015. 
um, 2015 was with correction. Without correction, he was 2020. And so um, this is the reason that switching to DMET can be very satisfying. They have much faster visual recovery. Um, and then, so in a kind of in a larger study, they showed that at post-op month three, um, about, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there is a range of vision, but you can go from 2020 to 2040. Uh, the vast majority are better than 2020, similar to a DSEC. Um, and you have a smaller incision, as I mentioned, and it's a more anatomic result. Um, so the difficulties and complications that you can get with the DMEC, um, so the tissue preparation can be difficult. Um, the tissue is very delicate, as you uh, were able to see when we were preparing it. Um, there can be tissue loss. Sometimes when you're preparing it, you could lose parts of the tissue. That can be difficult. And the procedure itself, learning how to manipulate the tissue, learning how to tap, how to move, how to shallow the chamber, the fluid dynamics in the anterior chamber can be very difficult. And there are multiple courses specifically geared to towards this. Um, there's a longer time that the gas bubble has to stay in place, and that can be difficult for patients. And there's an increased rate of graft dislocation. So similar to DSEC, you can get pupillary block. We try to avoid with the PI, you treat it similarly to as we discussed before. Uh, graft detachment, though the one different thing from a DSEC, how much time do we have? Okay, almost done, one minute left, um, is that you can have small detachments, 10 to 25% that can actually be observed, especially if they're inferior. Um, I oftentimes, if it's greater than 10 to 15%, I won't observe, but people do observe the, uh, even greater ones and they can resolve. You have to watch your patient closely though. Um, if it's not resolving, you'll want to go ahead and do a rebubble. Upside down grafts are a real problem with DMEC. Initially, that was the number one reason for primary graft failure. And so now that we've gone to orientation marks, so such as an S stand, um, we don't ha have that problem anymore. But it is imp important to get your orientation marks. It is hard sometimes in difficult cases when you're tapping for a long time, it gets hard to remember what the orientation of the graft is. Um, you can get IOP elevation from steroids. You can get synechiae formation. So this is much more common than in BSEC because of all of the tapping, especially if it's a more complicated case. I and mean, then you can get interface pigment. These are oftentimes not visually significant. So it's an exciting time to be a corneal transplant surgeon. We have many options um, at, our, at our fingertips. Um, I believe there are some questions, which if you have time for, I would be uh, happy to answer. Dr. Christie, do you want me? So I see some questions here in the chat. Should I just go through them one by one? Do you want to read them to me? How do you want to do the question section? Yeah, I can read it for you, uh, Dr. Mara. Okay. So, so the Dr. Soundram had asked, like she had a case of DALC with graft milk from uh, POD14. And uh, what is her opinion on how, when should we go for a regraft? So, uh, the, so the melt has been controlled or the melt is not controlled? Um, yeah. And so I guess the question, so I guess we don't know. Um, the question, so it depends. So often, so the best practice would be if you can get the melt under control and things can be quiet first, you'll have obviously a lot of scarring. Um, then doing the re graft after waiting three months is good because you have less likely of your new graft rejecting. If you're unable to do that, I mean, if it's an aggressive melt and then you're doing a transplant in order to cure the melt because you're going to perforation or the patient is actually perforated, then you're doing a PK because of the perforation. So I guess it depends. But optimally control the melt, wait three months, and then do your regraft to kind of reduce the risk of rejection because that patient has now become a high-risk patient. Okay, that's perfect. So this were, uh, there was one other question on DVEC, like uh, just the decimator X is only without any transplantation. So have you, what is your experience on that? Um, so I have read about and seen those cases. I've actually not done one. Um, from what I gather, from what I've seen and what I've read, you have to be very careful about your patient selection. So I think it's going to be good in patients with fukes I'm not PBK. The reason I say that is you want the pathology to only be in the central cornea. Oftentimes with pseudopagic bullous keratopathy, there is endothelial cell loss both centrally and peripherally. So that would not be a good candidate. So you want someone with fuchs. And even with fuchs, if you notice when you look at patients at the slit lamp, and I know we have more fuchs here than you all do. 
Um, but there are different types of fuchs. So some people will have more gute centrally and not as many gute peripherally. Some will have gute that go all the way out peripherally. It's actually very important to look at that at your slit lamp. The gute are where the disease are with fuchs. And so those patients who mainly have gute concentrated in the center with little peripheral pathology are the ones that would be best for DWEC. You need to talk to the patients and tell them that visual recovery is going to be slow. If you have a patient who's very demanding and wants vision to be perfect in a week or two, DWEC is not for them. Uh, the third thing is uh, you want to, a lot of the results show that DWEC works better with the ROC inhibitors. And so Rapizudel um, is the one that's been reported most often. And so you want to do the procedure along with a ROC inhibitor. But I think as long as you have good patient selection, the pathology is only in the center, there are good outcomes. So basically they, when you do the DWEC, you're just doing a, des, a small desmetorexis about the central three to four millimeters. Um, and then you're waiting for the peripheral endothelium to grow and cover the central endothelium. And that can take months. So, you know, that, that you're looking, you need to tell your patients you're looking at at least three to six months. Um, but there are excellent outcomes. Um, and so, and I suspect we'll be hearing more about this in the years to come, uh, not having, because then once they're done, then you don't have to worry about any risk of rejection at all. Um, and so I think that that's a pretty exciting development, but it's only good for a very select few patients right now. Okay, so the next question is on what is the injector that you use in the uh, that you used in the DMAT video that you showed, and there was one more question by uh, same Dr. Neha Vyas. Like, do you do venting incisions to remove interface fluid in DSEC? Uh -huh. Okay, so for the injector, this was for the DMEC injector or for the DSEC? I think the injector was for the DMEC and for venting DMEC. incisions for the DSEC. Yeah. Um, so for the injector, I use what was described in the modified um, Strico Jones tube kind of injector. And so the modified um, Strico Jones tube is a Jones tube that's been modified for DMEC. So it's a glass tube um, and it comes um, in, basically I, I order it from Lion's Vision Gift. And so I, you have to connect it with a 14 French catheter to a 3cc syringe. So it requires a little bit of work in the operating room. Um, and so that's the one that I find to be the easiest. There have been others that have been described. There are gooder tubes um, that again, it's kind of a glass tube with an injector connected to a syringe. Um, if you don't have access to any of those and you still want to inject your tissue, um, again, my division chief, Dr. Jun, had described a bond tarody, um injector, which is basically an Alcon B cartridge um, which you connect with uh, IV tubing to a 3cc syringe. So you're kind of creating your own homemade syringe. So there are different ones. But the one I use that I like is the uh, modified Jones tube with the 3cc, uh, 3cc syringe and a 14 French catheter. Lions Vision Gift, actually, when they do give you the uh, preloaded tissue, actually send you all the materials for it all together. I believe Cornea Gen, if you order from them, also does the same for their Gooder tube. And so there are a couple of options. I don't know what the options are in India, unfortunately. Um, so that's something you'd have to look into. When it comes to venting incisions and DSEC was the next question, correct, Dr. Christie? Yeah, 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 please continue. And um, so uh, they are reported, so people do do them. I am not a fan of venting incisions personally. Um, I don't like creating any other possible uh, sources of astigmatism in my patient. And so usually I find that with putting a big air bubble in and sweeping, I'm able to get the air out of the interface. That being said, um, in literature and in cases that I've seen um, when I was a trainee, venting incisions can be of benefit. Um, so if you have a DSEC that for some reason you're having difficulty attaching in one specific area and you know that there's a fluid bubble and you're trying to sweep the fluid out and it's not working, doing a very small venting incision, it should not really be greater than a millimeter and it should be just a very quick stab incision in and out, can help release that fluid and can bring that graft to attach in that area. Um, I try to avoid them though, personally. Okay. So I was more interested in uh, Dr. Albert Jones uh, injector, which you were using, which had a saline fluid. Is it commercially available, uh, Dr. Wally? It is commercially available. So it is, so cornea, so it used to be Carolink, which I, is now owned by cornea gen, uh, by, I mean, by site life, uh, cornea gen site life. And so I believe they're the ones providing it now. I can double check and get back to you on that. The trade name is the Desipro. 
And so it's a, it's a fantastic, it's a curved forceps. So it's kind of like a retinal forceps, except it's curved because that makes it much easier to manipulate the corneal tissue. And it has a sleeve around it um, that has BSS. And so initially when you uh, set it up, you have to kind of uh, put BSS into your syringe. So there's a 3cc syringe connected, which I didn't show you on the back end. And so when you're manipulating the forceps in one hand, with usually with your dominant hand, which in my case is my right hand, you're manipulating the forceps. So you're opening and closing it. So just like the retina forceps, it has a little kind of fan that you press to open and close it. You're doing that with your right hand. You have the syringe in your left hand. And so once you grab the tissue and you pull it into the eye, then you're using your left hand to inject fluid to try to open up the tissue. Then once the tissue is open, you don't inject tissue anymore. You don't inject fluid anymore with your left hand. You just let go with your right hand. And so it's called a Desipro, D-E-S-C-E-P-R-O. Okay, okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Medef. And there's okay. one more question on like, uh, what is the, I mean, how do you handle post-trap DMEC and DSEC uh, uh, cases, like the gas bubble problems and the post, uh, post-op pupillary blocks and all those complications? Yes. So in, uh, so in traps and tubes, generally you're not getting post-op pupillary block because usually the gas just goes away really quickly, right? Um, because you are in both, you have a peripheral iridectomy most of the time. And most of the time they have other iris abnormalities. Um, and so pupillary block is less of an issue. The bigger issue is the escape of gas. And so what I do, so I told you, usually in my DSEX, I usually leave the gas bubble at about 70 to 80%. In cases where there is either a trab or a tube, I will leave the air bubble at 100%. So I will just fill the entire anterior chamber. And the reason I do that is by the time I look at them two hours later in the recovery area, the gas bubble has already gone to 50 or 60%. I am much stricter with them on positioning. I try to be strict with everyone, but especially with my patients who have traps and tubes, I will tell them to be really strict that they're at higher risk of the graft dislocating. And I will tell them like almost just five minute breaks every two hours to get up, to eat, drink, or go to the bathroom. And as much as possible, I'll try to tell them not to use those breaks because even if it's just a 10 or 20% bubble, at least if it's right up against the cornea, you're less likely to dislocate. When it comes to DMEX, I actually have not started doing DMEX in trabs and tubes, um, although I know that people are doing them. Um, so I still do DSEX because usually anyway, my patients with traps and tubes usually have other complicating factors. Um, in DMEX, similarly, it's the you're using SF6 gas, but that still tends to escape. And so leaving a larger gas bubble, so closer to 90, probably not 100% because it is gas, so you'll, you could get pupillary block, theoretically speaking, um, but closer to 90%, again, being strict about positioning. The other thing about DMEX, so the issue with traps and tubes, it's not only the issue of gas escaping, it's when you're manipulating the tissue intraoperatively, the tissue can actually escape through the tube. Um, or through the ta uh, through the trab. And so it can get lodged in there because the tissue is actually very small when it scrolls up. And so you have to be very careful. Some people have actually reported putting a little bit of viscoelastic at the tip of the tube um, to allow the gas not to escape. Um, but you'd have to be careful. You wouldn't want to do that with the tissue in place because if the tissue touches the viscoelastic, you'll have a very difficult time trying to unfold it. And so there's kind of multiple complications with the DMEC, but it is actually still doable. People are reporting it and they're reporting excellent outcomes. So, Okay. So there was one more question by uh, Dr. Veena Shri. Like, what are your tips for orienting the DMEC graft on the right side up? For rot if if you if it was upside down, yeah, yeah. For orienting on the right side, I think you have the pre-stamped tissues there. Yes. So I I I 100% of the time I use the orientation. Um. So if you're not using the orientation, there are ways to tell based on how the scroll is. So the endothelium usually likes to scroll with the endothelium in. So if you have your tissue and it's kind of scrolled like this, then the endothelium is in. So you wouldn't want to start tapping then. You would want to reverse it so that it's curved. So then basically it's curved with the scrolls underneath and then you would want to tap it out. So there are ways to tell visually, um, but I think honestly the best way is to just have an orientation stamp. Okay, so that's uh, good. Uh, next question was from Dr. Raj Kumar. Like, uh, what will be your donor graft endothelial cell count criteria for planning DSEC or DMEC? 
So it so there so the um, what criteria again, Dr. Christie? Uh, yeah. So the endothelial cell count criteria to uh, I mean to label it as to be used for DSEC or DMEC. From the from the eye bank, you mean? Yes, yes, yes. For donor tissue. Yeah, from the donor tissue. So for so for us, there is no difference. So generally speaking, I think most surgeons in the U.S. will want to use um, and and this varies, but endothelial cell crowns greater than two thousand microns. Um, I mean, two thousand cells per uh, millimeter cubed, and I think that's pretty standard. We don't we don't differentiate for DSEC or DMEC. What we do differentiate is the age of the tissue. So for a DSEC, any age will do. Oftentimes, we tend to like younger tissue just because we feel like it will have longer survival, although in the uh, corneal preservation uh, study, that's not necessarily the case. In the MEC tissue, you actually want tissue where the donor is age greater than 60, 65. The reason being, younger tissue tends to form a tighter scroll. A tighter scroll means it's going to be harder for you to get it to unscroll in the operating room. Older tissue is less likely to scroll that tightly. And so uh, we tend to want a uh, slightly older tissue, but cell counts are, that we use for both are about the same. And we usually, like I said, about greater than 2000. Okay, so that's uh, great. So the last question for today, what do you usually prefer? Is it DSEC or DMEC in your personal practice? What is superior for you? So if there, so at this point, I almost always do a DMEC unless there's a reason not to. So as I said, I have not switched to doing DMECs in complicated eyes. Um, so the either tubes, traps, post-vitrectomized eyes. Um, so eyes where I feel like the surgery will be more difficult. But in a patient in whom I want the fastest and the best visual recovery, I do DMEC. It is a significant difference when compared to DSEC. It's, it's not as significant when you're comparing it to ultra-thin DSEC, um, but uh, ultimately I think that uh, DMEC is uh, better. So that's what I mostly do in my practice. But like I said, we have at Wilmer a lot of complicated eyes, a lot of eyes with who've had multiple surgeries, vitrectomized, multiple posterior anterior synechia, even before you start the surgery. And so in those eyes, I'm still doing DSEC. Okay, so what is your opinion on combined cataract surgery and DMEC? Do you do a staged procedure or a combined one? Um, so I used to do a stage procedure. I have also done combined procedures. Um, both are doable. I think initially there was some suggestion that the chance of rejection is less if you did a staged procedure. And so I was doing my cataract surgery two weeks before I did my DMEX surgery. Um, I've also done them as combined surgeries and it's pretty easy to do. Um, the After you do the cataract surgery though, you do wanna use some myocol because you don't want a large pupil when you're doing your DMEX surgery. It can make the surgery a little more difficult. Um, and in that vein, you don't want to use really strong dilating drops at the beginning because you want them to wear off a little bit quicker. Um, and so I've done both um, and both are doable. I think when you're starting, it's easier to do a staged procedure. Uh, the eye is a little bit uh, more floppy after a cataract surgery. Things are not as firm. Things haven't scarred in place. Um, the lens moves up and down a little more. So when you're starting, I would suggest doing a staged procedure. And then once you're comfortable, then you can move to a combined procedure. Okay, so um, there was one other question which popped out now from Dr. Kiran. Uh, what is the choice of procedure for pseudophagic bullous keratopathy? Uh, so either, so I would still lean towards the DMEC. Um, so because they still have good outcomes. The main difference, which I actually did not discuss in my lecture with Fuchs and PBK, is that it's much harder to do your desmetorexis in pseudophagic bullous keratopathy because there's a lot of kind of inflammatory, subclinical inflammatory scarring in these cases. And the desmase membrane is not thickened in the same way that it is in Fuchs because that's just not the pathology. And so um, we do our, I, I would do your best to do a desmetorexis. However, if you're having trouble doing a desmetorexis, if you're not able to, um, as long as you don't have any tags anywhere um, and there are no gutae, oftentimes in pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, you don't have bullet, you can leave the decimase in place and just do your DMEC uh, surgery um, because you can, you'll still get good adhesion and you'll still get good visual recovery. So that does happen sometimes in pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, but DMEC is still my procedure of uh, choice in PBK. 
Okay, so there we come to the end of the chat questions. So that was a very wonderful lecture, Dr. Mehra, with all the nice videos we were able to understand in a more better way. And uh, thank you once again. And uh, I'm sure we'll be calling you back for more lectures like this. Be prepared for it. And uh, stay healthy and stay home. Thank you. I hope you all stay healthy as well. It's wonderful to speak with all of you at Pondicherry. Again, hopefully I'll be able to visit when all of this pandemic ends. Yeah, so, yeah, sure, uh, sure. <laughs> good luck with everything. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye. Welcome, welcome, Mera. Uh, thank you, Dr. Venkatesh. Come.